moving now into the metastatic setting, ultimately what we try to do in the post-CDK4-6 inhibitor setting is employ targeted therapies in our relevant populations, and the latest data that has come out is evaluating these in combination. So based on the results of Evera study at ESMO 2025, where do you see the combination of SIRDs and mTOR inhibitors, which are now designed to target multiple signaling pathways, fitting into the ER-positive metastatic breast cancer landscape when compared to, for example, SIRDs alone? Yeah, I think that's a hard question. And honestly, that kind of second line endocrine space has just gotten infinitely more complicated with options. If we don't have mutations, multiple options, even if we do, um, I'll say the gyridestrant data, um, you know, I think they talked a lot about how the benefit was in the intention to treat, uh, but 60% of the patients had ESR1 mutations. And when they showed the subset of patients that were wild type ESR1, there was no, no benefit. It was 5.5 versus 5.7. Seven months. So my takeaway from that trial is we have another great option, um, you know, gyridestrant in combination with Everolimus for patients that have ESR1 mutations, but I don't anticipate seeing approval for all comers there. Um, you know, I think it's a trade-off when we talk about individual oral SIRDs or endocrine agents, you know, even Protax like Vepdegastrant versus combinations. Uh, a lot of times with the combinations, we think we can get a little bit higher efficacy, longer PFS, but whenever we combine, it comes with a side effect, uh, you know, risk and a little bit worse toxicity. We know combining uh, with the PI3 mTORs, there's a special set of side effects there. We know combining with abemacyclib, for example, adds a little bit of side effects. And so we really have to take into the patient in front of us what they want, what their mutational profile of their tumor looks like and make a decision kind of uh, honestly with shared decision making with the patient. For those patients, for example, who do not have an ESR1 mutation or a PIG3CA mutation, would you consider the Victoria 1 regimen and what are your thoughts on that trial design? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's interesting. You know, I, I think our struggle with uh, Victoria and the PI3 still seem to be tolerability. What was interesting around gadatilisib is that it's an IV inhibitor. So it's given once a week uh, IV. And all of our other PI3 or AKT inhibitors, you know, alpalisib, anavilisib, or capivacertib, the AKT are oral. And so, you know, our hyperglycemia tends to be the highest with anabolisib and alpalisib. Capivacertib, it's quite a bit better. And I think gadatilisib really did add uh, a little bit in terms of better tolerability, but it comes with the trade-off of being IV weekly and what otherwise is an all-oral regimen. So again, I think those individual uh, differences between the patients are going to play into uh, how these may be used um, if and when we see a regulatory approval there. Perfect. All right. So when we were actually together at ASCO this year, we had heard some data from Serena Six that was evaluating the use of a switch strategy to the oral CERD camazesterant upon the detection of positive ctDNA. And at ESMO 2025, the patient reported outcomes that were highly anticipated from this trial was, were presented. So can you tell us a little bit more about this and what your thoughts were? Yeah, so I mean, this is really, you know, a paradigm shift for us, which honestly, I think is why we're spending so much time really thinking about it. You know, we we are not typically uh, switching therapy in the absence of progression for with patients uh, that have metastatic disease. And so, as you said, this is emergence of ESR1 in the absence of progression and, you know, continuing that AI and CDK or switching to camizestrin, the oral CERD and CDK. And what we saw is if you switch, you delay... Um, you know, ultimate progression. But a lot of questions of, you know, are you just eating through those therapies quicker? Are we going to impact overall survival? But one of the really interesting things we saw was this improved quality of life. And so that led to a lot of questions. You know, was that uh, quality of life maybe that patients were starting to have symptoms before we could detect progression on this CT scans. And so when we got these uh, patient reported outcomes back, in fact, there were a lot of things that looked a little bit better uh, with the cami zesterant. Um, I did find the, the uh, pain particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. A lot of other things like shortness of breath, et cetera, separated around that three month mark, which would make sense. That's probably the time that patients are really kind of starting to progress. But we saw pain separate at the one month mark. And so initially my thoughts really were, 
well, could it just be that camizestrin is better tolerated in terms of bone pain and arthralgias than an aromatase inhibitor? And so I actually, actually asked that question. Um, but in the PROs, you know, they didn't detect like an improvement in pain. It was just deterioration of pain. And so their takeaway really was that there was something happening probably in the bone um, very early with the emergence of an ESR1 uh, mutation um, in the absence of progression that was maybe contributing to that. So I, I think, you know, we um, are kind of in the spot that we're starting to think about how we may incorporate this. It's going to take serial ESR1 mutation testing. We don't have a mechanism right now to order an ESR1 by itself outside of a broad panel, although I hear that's coming uh, later in 2026. So I think we're going to be starting to have these conversations with patients about what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of maybe monitoring for ESR1 in the um, absence of progression. 100%. I think agreed shared decision making here is going to be key as we're getting more of this data. So thank you so much, Dr. Hamilton. On their 50th year anniversary, ESMO 2025 was an unprecedented Congress with such a great deal of practice changing data. My last question for you in the, for ESMO 2025, obviously there was a lot more data that was presented, Ascento 3, Tropiano 2, Destiny Breast 05, Destiny Breast 11, among so many others, but what data did you find the most thought provoking? Yeah, I think the takeaway really was kind of uh, at least two big studies in all three subgroups of breast cancer. So we spent a lot of time today talking about ER positive, um, but the takeaways in HER2 positive were really DB05 and DB11, mm -hmm. taking trastuzumab, deruxtecan into the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting, respectively. And then in triple negative, uh, a similar uh, vein of thought, moving antibody drug conjugates up into the earlier line. And so specifically, um, this was tropian breast, as well as ascent and, um, you know, two trope 2 targeted antibody drug conjugates given in a little bit different way, but moving them into first line metastatic triple negative breast cancer for patients that are not eligible for immunotherapy pembrolizumab. Uh, so I think it was kind of the year of the ADC, to be honest, at ESMO 2025. I know you like to say moving on up, and I feel like that's what we're doing here. So that's awesome. Well, thank you for being here with me today. I think we had a great discussion about updates in hormone-positive breast cancer. I'm sure there's much more to come, but thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.